tonight's program we have called The View from Space, Stories of the World in Its Entirety. I'll try to give you a sense of what we're after here tonight. In July of 1969, the Eagle landed. A lot of us watched it intently. We were watching it. It was late. It was past my bedtime, but I stayed up to watch it happen. Kind of a grainy, fuzzy, black and white photograph came from the moon, and it looked very much to my childish mind like the dust-covered floor of my closet. It was actually a pretty exciting, there was a crackling energy in the house, but really for me, it was uh, hard to distinguish between the truth of what I was seeing and the realm of fiction that I always enjoyed getting from the television set. It wasn't really until Life magazine published a full-color photograph of the Earth rising above the moon that it really struck me in all of its awe and grandeur what had happened. And I realized then that we had, like the peddler of Swatham, traveled a great distance to discover the treasure that we had at home. The world looked at itself for the very first time. The late mythographer Joseph Campbell suggested during his interviews with Bill Moyers that that one moment will mark a turning point in the mythology of the world, that the planet has come to possess our imaginations. And when I look around me today, in the popular culture, everywhere I turn, I see that that is true. Images of our planet abound. I see it stamped on the side of the uh, shampoo bottles when I go to get my hair cut. I see it in my son's lunch as he puts in a bag of chips from Planet Lunch. I see it when I watch the Olympic Games and they constantly are showing this mysterious landscape of our world spinning around as a graphic, sometimes fractured, sometimes made into some kind of a fairy dust image, but it's there, isn't it? And if you think about it, you can probably imagine how ubiquitous these images of the earth are now in our day-to-day -day lives. And it just helps me to think and to believe that perhaps what Professor Campbell had suggested was indeed true, that we have now begun a new age in which we look at ourselves as one planet. The world is rich with the stuff that life springs from. Proteins, amino acids, soil, silicates, if you will, water, by all means, but also something else, metaphor. For metaphor is the culture that grows our stories, and our stories create our world. And tonight, we want to look at how our stories inform the world that we live in and our view of this planet, Earth. David, you have just told a creation story. A creation story that begins with the dust of the earth, soil from which everything is made. There's a creation story of the earth diver type, I would say. There's several types of stories, of creation stories. There's the cosmic egg type. There's the earth diver type. Most of them are creator types. Creator commands and things happen. But this one is like, sort of like a one that the Maidu Indians of California have. Uh, they tell of Earth Starter. That was their creator. Earth Starter came down from heaven, and there he found a turtle floating on a raft. And Earth, uh, Earth um, Starter landed on the raft, and he said to Turtle, I want to make some Earth but I need some dry land. I need some soil. And Turtle said, well, if you'll just tie a rope around my leg, I'll dive down and I'll get you some soil. So Turtle's leg was roped and Earth Starter let him go down and Turtle stayed six years. And when he came up, he was all covered with slime, green slime, like your pickle jar. And the only earth he had was under his nails. And Earth Starter scraped that little bit of mud from under Turtle's nails, made it into a little ball, put it on the end of the raft, and watched, and the whole thing grew into the world. 
so that was the earth diver type of story that you just told. But probably the creation story that most of us in this room are familiar with is the one from Genesis. Certainly the one I grew up with in Texas on a farm. And back then, we didn't really wonder where things came from. We knew, we had been told, God made them. God made everything. So back then, I had all the answers. Now, I just have all the questions. But anyway, you know, I used to, I used to pick cotton. We used to work real hard in the daytime, and then by nighttime, we'd be so tired, and we would sit on the front porch. Our house faced west and faced the sunset, and we would sit there in the cool of the evening and enjoy and rest in at the end of the day, watching the sunset, gorgeous colors. I can still see my grandmother on this porch, and she it was depression time, and grandmother was old. She was a widow. She was living from children to children in that house and not a really happy time and she'd look out toward that sunset and she'd sing that old old hymn beyond the sunset's radiant glow there is a brighter world i know beyond the sunset i may spend delightful days that never end but you know religion springs from a need and she needed to hope for something she needed to hope for something that was better than uh, picking cotton. To me, picking cotton was hard, but I was young and I could foresee the future. She couldn't see much, but maybe beyond the sunset's radiant glow. And then when the sun would go down, we would watch the scissor tails diving and diving. They'd go up and up and up and then purr down, catching mosquitoes and other crepuscular insects. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely word? crepuscular insects and then when the dark would come the sky was absolutely gorgeous because it was dark where we lived no street lights very very dark and the sky was just sparkling with wonderful stars because the stars at night are big and bright deep in the heart of texas <laughs>